In what follows, I would like to briefly talk about how the Ottoman chronicle writers in the late 17th century narrated or depicted King Sobieski in, its historical account, in their historical accounts of the wars between the Ottomans and their European rivals. My main aim is not only to provide a glimpse into how the Ottomans perceived King Sobieski, uh, a great historical figure of his time, but also to touch upon the critical problem of representations and canonization of war, victory, and defeat, together with their historical figures from an episode of conflict in our shared history. To begin with, I might need to work on two computers. To begin with, let me read this advertising note about a very recently published book on the historical imagination of uh, Sobieski. The deadly deeds and virtues of Jan III Sobieski gained him recognition across Europe. After the victory at Vienna in 1683, the Polish king was glorified in numerous languages in all corners of the continent, the Eastern monarch's military genius gaining recognition for saving the Christian world. Foreigners wrote poems to Jan III, praising his martial talents, not only in the press and countless leaflets, but also in iconography, particularly graphics. The image of Sobieski became recognizable became as recognizable as the portraits of the Pope, Emperor, and the King of France. I will say, indeed, King Sobieski has rightfully become an iconic figure in the Western world ever since 1683, associated with terms very respectful, very praiseful, such as the savior of Christendom, quote, from the Ottomans. The king's decisive victory against the Ottoman imperial army besieging Vienna under the command of Grand Vizier Karam Mustafa Pasha quickly invaded the European publics at large, thanks to the media of the time in the form of newsletters, famlets, memoirs, engravings, private letters, etc., as noted by uh, Magdalena Gorska, the author of the book over here. Another scholar, Cecile Delbis, uh, working on the same topic, the historic reception of Sobieski, also notes this. The first set of information on the Battle of Vienna, which circulated within major European towns, were the letters and diaries written by the soldiers, monks, diplomats, and servants who eyewitnessed this uh, siege. Whereas, on behalf of Sobieski, his first initiative after plundering the Ottoman military camp and his triumphal entry in Vienna, was to write several letters so as to publicly announce his great victory. These letters were dated, quote unquote, from the tent of the Grand Vizier on the 13th of September, 1683, where they were also copied in multiple forms, as well as translating, translated, including different dialects. In these letters, the victorious Sobieski called his political allies and fellow Christians for the continuation of the Holy War and promised the end of the Muhammad, that is, the Ottoman Empire. So this image of uh, uh, Sobieski, as also seen in this uh, book cover from 1915, uh, written by Count Sobieski, as you can see, uh, one of the uh, subtitles is uh, The Savior of Christendom. So this image uh, uh, remained by him for a long time. Um, and he wrote to Pope Innocent XI, quote, we came, we saw, and God conquered, echoing Julius Caesar's famous remark on the conquest of Pontus, which is in modern Turkey. And he sent this banner that was seized during the uh, uh, final battle uh, to Pope as a reminder of his great victory. Well, in the coming years and decades, the Ottoman defeat, or Sobieski's victory at Vienna, continued to be of great interest to many. Accordingly, his victory and the Ottoman debacle became the subjects of new paintings, poems, other literary and visual works. These second set of sources try to explain what happened at Vienna more in details, sometimes attributing the king's success to a set of marvels or intervention of some religious figures. Most prominently, it was regarded as the act of God. 
At this point, let me note that uh, the Ottoman Turks in these written and visual sources had a peculiar imaginary of historical significance. They were typically depicted with the crescent moon and turbans. This is an everlasting uh, typological image long associated with the Muslims, which clearly served an ideological purpose. That is, the enemy appears under a simplified mask of evilness, cruelty, and as a uh, devourer of kingdoms of excessive pride. Now, these visual and textual references, as Cecile Dalby note, also served a domestic or a continental context. For instance, in the Spanish sources about 1683, which are right at the time written, the Turks were of partisan of an unfair war, acting together with the French, which was the archenemy of the Spanish Habsburgs at the time. Moreover, the accounts and images of Sibueski and the Battle of Vienna in 1683 were included into a ready-made historical and narrative frame. This is to say a great saga of the Crusades and the related Christian victories against Muslim, Muslims in the past. Hence, Sobieski's victory was not considered as something wholly new or unexpected that changed the course of history, but instead as a result, as a logical result, that explained the entire course of time in a messianic vision of the world in which God is present. In such complicated ways, as I try to summarize, the second and failed Ottoman siege of Vienna in 1683 kept, kept, kept captivating the imagination of generations of people in Europe. Yet, in conventional Ottoman historiography, the year 1683 and the name Jan Sobieski had, de um, had de uh, denoted a negative element in the course of Ottoman history, uh, or put in other words, uh, the Ottomans, who were until that moment proved to be militarily the most sophisticated rivals uh, of European monarchs, finally entered the final stages of an imperial decline after a long period of crisis since the 1580s. Within this context, let me uh, briefly visit the contemporary Ottoman chronicler's narrative of siege of Vienna and delineate how the king of polish Lithuanian uh, commonwealth, King Sobieski, portrayed, was portrayed by these authors. For this purpose, I selected a few chronicles, as can be seen in this list. They are all from the later part of the 17th century, uh, written mostly prominent authors, bureaucrats, or officials of uh, the Ottoman uh, political establishment, uh, Abdurrahman Abdi Pasha, Fındıklı Silahtar Mehmet Ağa, Defterdar Sarı Mehmet Pasha, Sir Mustafa Efendi. These are very well-known sources about uh, the last uh, quarter of the 17th century, and especially I selected them because they include sections on the Siege of Vienna and after uh, Siege of Vienna, other uh, uh, military conflicts between uh, the Ottoman and the European uh, armies. Uh, and there are also anonymous uh, works, uh, such as the history of Vienna, Bekayi Bech, and also an anonymous long uh, history of uh, Ottoman history from uh, 1683, 88 to 1704. Now, before going into the details of uh, how uh, King Sobieski fares uh, in these accounts, let me first note that the very imp uh, important moment, the very important event that resulted uh, by the enthronement of King Sobieski in uh, 1674 as the king of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, takes a small, kind of a brief uh, uh, space uh, in Ottoman uh, chronicles. Here, for instance, Ahtar Mehmet writes, Leh Cumhuru ve Asker Taifesi, Krallığa senden Eyü Uğurlu Adem Olmaz Deyü, Leh Vilayetinin Adetine Muhalif, Sobieski Nam Kir Hatman'ı getürüp Leh Kralı Nasbu Tay, Tayin eylediler. So, just to paraphrase it, uh, the, public, uh, the Polish public and the soldiers, uh, we cannot find a better person than you for the uh, kingship. Uh, uh, they chose uh, Sobieski, uh, who was known also as Kir Hatman, uh, as their new king. So this is probably uh, one of the uh, best representative accounts that we can find how Sobieski also recorded in terms of his first uh, 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 moment of, uh, as king. 
As we shall see, as the Ottoman Empire and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth kept fighting each other in the coming decades, his historical importance, I mean Sobieski's historical importance, in the eyes of the Ottomans increased to a certain extent. In the writings of contemporary Ottoman authors, King Sobieski most of features as a, as a combatant enemy in negative terms. Well, there is nothing unusual about this particular depiction or image of the king. Uh, you may say, or we may say, the king crushed the Ottoman imperial army with a sounding victory, and sounding victories both before and after 1683. Now, what is really interesting about the accounts uh, regarding Sobieski III is that his victory at Vienna occupies less space or carries less emphasis in Ottoman accounts than why this defeat actually happened. I mean, the contemporary accounts and their uh, uh, contemporary authors uh, and their accounts basically seek the reasons for the debacle and mentions primarily the mistakes done by Grand Vizier Kara Mustafa Pasha, both in planning the siege as well as the undertaking of it. So, how does Sobieski fare in these Ottoman writers' accounts? Well, I put um, a few examples. I'm not going to go all of them, uh, but just to uh, give a context to why this particular negative language we see here is that Ottomans very proud of themselves uh, when recording their victories or recording their wars vis-a-vis uh, -vis both their e eastern and western uh, rivals, typically used some derogatory terms, and especially uh, when they were at war with their enemies. So these are more or less traditional attributions for an enemy. Traitor, cursed. Infidel, literally it means without religion, laden with defeat or destined to, to defeat. The leader of devils, which is, by the way, the last one over here, uh, is something unusual uh, because uh, shayatin, which is uh, the plural of shaitan, the devil, uh, is used as, the, as for the leader of things. So probably uh, Sobieski's uh, victory really pissed him off, this particular author. So, just like the changing or reconfigured image of Sobieski in European slash Western narratives and visual sources, as I uh, noted uh, ago, uh, a minute ago, as time went on, the Ottomans also changed the way uh, uh, they depict him. Uh, they changed the way uh, they portray him in a different light. We can say with more objective terms or language. For instance, Silahtar Mehmeta as well as Abdurrahman Abdi Pasha, uh, I'm sorry, uh, for instance, Silahtar Mehmeta, in his coverage of the events after around 1690, so seven years after uh, Vienna, drops using the above mentioned insulting words on Sobieski and instead simply referring, preferring to call him the Polish king. And he also notes some of the uh, diplomatic relations between the Ottoman court and the Polish court in a very objective manner. Other writers make the same change. For instance, um, uh, for instance, uh, Abdurrahman Abdi Pasha notes the diplomatic correspondence between the Sultan and the Polish king briefly, without using any derogatory terms or adjectives. Uh, and such a direct, non-judgmental record of diplomatic context between the two states thus points to a renewed image of King Sobieski in the Ottoman historical uh, literature. And we can say that he now was regarded as one of the European rulers with whom the Ottomans had to establish and sustain a proper diplomatic and political relationship. Unfortunately, and this is something I want to also uh, note here, that there are not many uh, sources, uh, especially visual sources, uh, the Ottomans made themselves to depict uh, European rulers. Now, in the 16th century, uh, Sultan Suleiman, uh, for instance, ordered uh, his son Selim II and his grandson uh, Murat III, they all ordered, asked 
for the representations of the European kings. And we have like albums uh, from the 16th century depicting these European monarchs, from the Habsburgs, from to the Russians. Uh, but in the 17th century, we don't really have too many of such albums, except the albums that were done to portray the Ottoman sultans themselves. So that's why uh, there's no visual record of Sobieski that I am aware of to show you over here. But there is a very important part of this historical relationship between the two countries. Uh, Silahtar Mehmeta, for instance, once wrote that Vienna had been such a big defeat so great that there has never been its like since the first appearance of the Ottoman state. He was right. The Battle of Ankara in 1402, in which Tamerlane captured the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid I, had been more devastating. And after Vienna, there is no question that the Europeans had attempted to keep the Ottoman, uh, I'm sorry, uh, after Vienna, the relationship between Europe and the Ottoman Empire began to change. For centuries, since the early 14th century, the Europeans had attempted to keep the Ottomans at bay, and if possible, to recapture areas, most notably some religious uh, uh, regions like Palestine, that they considered to be sacred for their religion. Now, by Vienna, as Ottoman power uh, is considered to be weakened, it also became possible to imagine not merely limiting the Ottomans or Ottoman power in Europe, but also its eventual uh, retreat. Thus the Habsburgs were quick to capitalize on the success of Vienna by Sobieski. In March 1684, in an unusual show of solidarity, Austria, Venice, Poland, Lithuania under Sobieski, the Grand Duchy of Tuscany and Malta, and the papacy formed a holy league against the sublime port. Two years later, on September 2nd, 1686, they secured their first major victory when the Hungarian city of Buda, uh, which since 1526, uh, actually 1641, uh, had stood on the frontier between Christendom and Islam. So it fell to the besieging Habsburg army, and for the Ottomans, the loss of Buda was an immense psychological significance, a trauma, we can say. The failure to take Vienna had been a crushing humiliation for the mighty Ottoman armies, but Vienna had always been a Christian European city. Buda, on the other hand, was considered a Muslim city, a part of the abode of Islam, Darul Islam. Hence, it resulted in another set of uh, Ottoman writings, particularly uh, by the religious the clergy, uh, uh, advising the Sultan what to do to regain these territories. But, it was gone. After 1683, the Ottoman army found itself in an unprecedented sequence of conflicts on multiple fronts that superseded the siege war, warfare of earlier times against the armies of the Holy League, which, by the way, had reformed their warfare and military tactics uh, for some time. For instance, in the 15 years between 1683 and 1697, the Ottomans engaged in 15 major uh, field battles, but one won only two of them. One battle ended in stalemate, and all others were won by the Allied forces of the League. The Ottomans suffered their greatest defeats at, at Nagi Harshani in 1687, Sl Slankamen in uh, 1691, uh, and this is the uh, battle uh, Grand Vizier Köprül Fazıl Mustafa Pasha fallen, uh, at Senta in 1697. The troops of the Holy League were victorious in all these three battles. The numerical, tactical, strategic, firepower spirit of the Ottoman armies over, uh, over the Ottomans during these wars were a relatively novel development. The European armies were now able to defeat their major adversary thanks to the ongoing military reforms. They achieved uh, this particular uh, superiority in the course of the Thirty Years' War. The changes uh, in the European armies that occurred during these years were generally regarded as an important phase in the so-called military revolution. Better trained and more disciplined armies, having more flexibility in battle and better quality weaponry, along with a higher and uh, very active firing power, which, by the way, Sobieski was very well aware, were facing 
now the Ottomans. Furthermore, owing, the, owing these advances of military revolution, the Europeans were capable of raising an army that was similar in size to that of the Ottomans. And one may say that all of these interrelated military and political developments became more and more critical and decisive after the Battle of Vienna and during the reign of its true hero, a seasoned commander of these battlefields, King Jan III Sobieski. Thank you. And here are the images that had remained with us since then. Szanowni Państwo, czy są jakieś pytania do naszego prelegenta? Nie, przetłumaczę. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to ask uh, what happened later in the later sources, whether the later Turkish authors repeated rather the <laughs> Ottoman authors of the later period uh, with, uh, let's say, more uh, diplomatic uh, epithets of the King uh, Jan III Sobieski or whether they were uh, referring to uh, less uh, favorite words. Thank you so much. Uh, a great question. Um, uh, brief talk. Uh, I was actually not sure whether to go into the later period because, of course, the later period sources uh, have some different versions. Uh, but I can say two things. One, uh, the official uh, narrative uh, that was adopted by a little later, let's say, in the late 19th century in the textbooks that were, for instance, assigned to high school kids, uh, of course, like 200 years later, uh, they present, of course, a shorter version uh, of uh, the relations between the Ottomans and the Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth, and particularly, of course, uh, uh, the king, uh, Sobieski. Uh, and uh, they mention, again, like these uh, contemporary sources do, not Sobieski as the great, you know, commander, the tactician, who at the last minute came as the, you know, uh, rescue army, uh, but the failures of Mustafa Pasha, why he didn't really see what was coming. So it was still, uh, even 200 years later, a similar emphasis. But in the 18th and 19th century also, there is a second literature that developed, and this is like more in the form of the political advice literature that kept referring, uh, again, the mistakes that were done at Vienna, uh, but this time, of course, noting to take Sobieski and other uh, European rulers as examples of the right, you know, way of action. In the 20th century, of course, as we get closer to our time, uh, Sobieski become, you know, because of the relations between modern, of course, states, uh, is recognized as, you know, a great ruler of the time, and uh, he's actually given, you know, uh, even with some images of him included. So, uh, that's kind of a 300-year story of this historical uh, historiography, I will say. Czy mają Państwo jeszcze pytania? This means either I was so good <laughs> that nobody had any question, that everything is clear, or I was really bad. <laughs> Dobrze, mamy pytanie, proszę bardzo. Thank you. I will use the interpreter if possibly. In Poland, since, I'd say, since like for the last century, the 17th century probably, we've had this debate whether Sobieski was right by supporting the Habsburgs or not. So the question is whether Sobieski was right supporting Habsburgs or not. Let me repeat the beginning of the question. For a very long time, we've had this debate 
between scholars, but also between other members of the society, whether Sobieski was right providing hub support to Habsburgs and to Vienna. We know that 100 years la later on, uh, Austria took part in the partitions. And it's clear that Sobieski had a wife. She was French, and she was very pro-French. She uh, supported this French and Turkish alliance. But in fact, the prevalent view is that Poland, as a Christian party, had to defend Christianity. So there is this mainly uh, religious domination. The question is, what was the prevalent argumentation in Turkey at that time? Whether it was just searching for new lands, new Lebensraum, or rather fighting Christians. What, what was the main motive behind fighting Habsburgs? That's my first question, but I have the other one as well. You mentioned, sir, that Sobieski is an icon. He's a very well-known figure. But is it true in Turkey? What percentage of educated people in Turkey know the name of Sobieski? Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, let me start from the second question, easier to answer. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for the, I don't want to call common people, but let's say a, a medium educated person, let's say by high school, uh, probably won't remember uh, the name Sobieski right away. Uh, because first of all, our history, as any other nation's history, are full of names, so it will be very difficult to uh, remember the uh, European uh, kings. But they will, for instance, definitely remember Louis XIV, the Sun King, because it is emphasized more in the sources. Uh, so uh, for a good student, for a good student of history, Sobieski is not a foreign name because of Vienna. I mean, uh, it is recorded. Actually, uh, I recently checked uh, a textbook that was printed in the late 19th century. And there, for instance, his name was underlined. So I think uh, Sobieski is known uh, for those uh, kind of devoted readers of history. For the first question, well, of course, as you said, uh, it is a debate, or it has been uh, scholarly debated. Um, the late 17th century uh, European politics had been really uh, uh, complicated, and uh, the overwhelming influence and power of France uh, since the Thirty Years' War, the I would say relative decline of Spain, the Habsburg Spain, leaving them also, you know, in such powerful position, uh, enabled them to dictate a lot of terms on other uh, parties. So I'm not an expert on that particular uh, uh, relationship, uh, but for Sobieski to uh, agree uh, to come and help uh, to the call, uh, uh, I think was only uh, a decision of that particular context. I don't believe these political rulers, despite you know they were visionary, they had they known the like like facts on the grounds very well. I don't believe they had this long-term you know projection of what they should achieve in the end, because the emergency was there. And for those of our uh, uh, friends here not familiar with the context, that uh, even the Ottomans kept their target as Vienna, as uh, I'm sure most people know, uh, at the last minute until Belgrade. So that's why, you know, it was kind of a, a quick decision to be, to be uh, made. And I believe uh, Sobieski's uh, decision rested on these two major factors. Now, there was another short, uh, I think, question about the Ottomans, uh, uh, you know, their uh, uh, target. Now, uh, First of all, it was their long dream to capture Vienna. And set by the, uh, by the visions of Suleiman the Magnificent, Suleiman the First. Uh, actually, I say second siege, but it, actually it is the third attempted siege because it was twice under Suleiman the Ottomans wanted to come. And here I think um, it will be a good point to make this uh, observation that most of these 
political figures like Sobieski, Vizir uh, Mustafa Pasha, Mehmet IV, of course, the Sultan of the time, um, they were ambitious people. They wanted to really show that, you know, they are still, you know, powerful, they are still, you know, uh, in control. So for that reason, uh, the destination uh, or the target of the, uh, of the, of the imperial campaign, uh, which was actually initially uh, planned to, you know, uh, secure a few more uh, castles before, you know, uh, moving to Vienna, uh, was changed to Vienna because mustard army, I mean, we are talking about a very sizable army the Ottomans uh, uh, came up with uh, in the last couple of uh, decades, not possibly uh, that much. So in that sense, I think um, uh, we should uh, pay attention to Karim Mustafa Pasha's, Karim Mustafa, uh, uh, Pasha's ambition to show himself. Uh, and I believe that was also uh, why Vienna was targeted. Thank you. Czy jeszcze mamy pytania? As you know from the history, there were many Turkish commanders who led their armies personally. Can you please tell us more from the Turkey perspective, from the perspective of commanders, what it all looked like or how it also influenced the development of the dynasty? There are those interesting soap operas, Turkish soap operas in Poland, so we are very much interested in that history, if you could tell us more about this. Okay, uh, I'm also part of these historical shows. Uh, you, you noted uh, as a consultant. Uh, so I th thank you very much because this is kind of my alley uh, because I had worked on the Ottoman Pashas of the uh, 17th century. Uh, let me note, for instance, among these historical sources, uh, these are general histories, but Ottomans also wrote about these individual campaigns led by these uh, Pashas. Uh, for instance, Ibrahim Pasha. Uh, Shaitan Ibrahim Pasha, uh, the devil, uh, and uh, Chehrin, for instance, the campaign against Chehrin. Uh, so these are also uh, uh, sponsored, these texts or uh, stories were sponsored by these Pashas or one of their uh, household members, of course, to praise uh, these Pashas' achievements. And you may simply imagine that uh, they don't write the defeats, they prefer to write the victories. So uh, we know from the history that uh, Ottomans were not always victorious or these Pashas were not victorious. So in that sense, uh, we have good accounts, uh, reliable accounts of these individual uh, stories of these Pashas in the wars. Um, I'm just trying to remember Tarihi uh, Kamenice, the history of Kamenice, uh, for instance. Uh, it was actually completed around 1680, so before uh, Vienna. Uh, and there, for instance, you see a lot of details about these you know, um, negotiations going on between the frontier commanders. Uh, of course, it, it, let me also uh, mention this. Uh, when we are talking about these conflicts and wars, big wars, uh, we simply assume that, let's say, the Ottomans targeted Vienna and there was a, you know, defending army, but it, it never takes, you know, that quick. There are so many negotiations going on to avoid, actually, the conflict at the end. So the Pashas especially were very critical, Ottoman Pashas were very critical in that particular uh, diplomatic relationship because they were assigned with an army to march to the frontier and then start, you know, uh, 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 making these uh, diplomatic negotiations. For instance, I remember Ibrahim Pasha uh, had been very, you know, uh, careful about his relationship with the Polish Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth. Uh, and of course, Kamenice became a huge issue uh, at the time. Uh, and also, uh, as also I'm sure everybody knows, the Crimean Tatar alliances, uh, which includes also those Pashas, you know, uh, uh, in the picture. So, that complicated picture uh, with all these individual uh, commanders, I will say, uh, make it really, you know, an interesting story. Uh, but if you're asking more specific, for instance, uh, names, 
top of my mind, I, 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 I cannot remember now. Uh, but yes, we do have stories, recorded uh, narratives of, of these pashas too. I hope that's a satisfactory answer. Any other questions? My question concerns the contemporary modern historians in Turkey. What do they believe about Crimean Tatars from the time of the siege of Vienna? I think it's a very, very difficult question to answer on my part. Um, I I know a little of uh, that uh, problem. Uh, one of our colleagues in Turkey, uh, Hakan Kremle from uh, 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 Ankara University, Bilkent University, I'm sorry, uh, he studied, for instance, this particular uh, problem, uh, how the Crimean Tatars, you know, in history, all the way to present, uh, were kept. I remember one thing I learned from him was that uh, there are these uh, uh, recently published works on the history of Crimea, which include some of these, you know, uh, uh, historical figures like Sahib Giraihan, uh, you know. Uh, so today in Turkey, uh, I would say not the artists, you know, they portray, but people get these historic names and their visualization through these uh, published works. Uh, and these are original sources. Turkey had gone through this uh, kind of boom in publishing historical sources, and this is really very recent. And uh, of course, uh, Crimean Tatars, uh, since the late 18th century, in massive numbers uh, migrated into you know what is today uh, Turkish lands, and uh, they have their villages, uh, you know, especially in Thrace and many parts of uh, modern Turkey. And uh, but that's where I should stop because uh, artistic depictions I don't know much uh, within their culture or within the larger public uh, in that sense. Thank you. <laughs>